get started, I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for all the good things in life uh, you give us, uh, being able to celebrate sports and uh, all, all the delights, uh, the extras you give us in life. I pray that you help us understand uh, today this uh, key point of theology, a uh, very practical point of theology that can help uh, all of our churches experience the unity uh, that you've designed. Uh, I pray you help us think your thoughts after you today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Messed that up. Um, so take uh, quiz 29. It seems like I've gotten the numbers messed up somehow. Uh, like as I'm grading the homework, it seems like my numbers have been one off somehow. And but anyway, we'll we'll call this uh, 29, and I think we'll be right. Uh, it won't count against you if uh, I've made a mistake. So, but. Uh, if you'll take uh, attendance 29, uh, I'll appreciate it. What we're going to look at today is this central argument of the book of Romans. And basically it's this, that Jesus is the new Adam. And if Jesus is the new Adam, then that means something for all of us who are connected uh, to Jesus. So what we're going to see is that Christians are connected to Jesus the same way that once we were connected to Adam. Christians are connected to Jesus the same way once we were connected to Adam. And if you think about that, uh, Adam played for the side. Uh, he played for the side and lost. And because he lost, he passed on to us a, a principle of corruption that uh, taints everything that we do. Uh, if left alone, that uh, principle that we inherited from Adam, which we ratify every single day of our lives, uh, if left alone, that principle will putrefy and lead to every possible uh, sin. But the great news is that Christians are now connected to Jesus the same way once we were connected to Adam. And what that means is, just as Adam passed on a sin nature, Jesus is passing on to us a new nature, a new heart. In fact, it's his heart. So we were once connected to Adam. Christians are connected to Jesus that same way. As Adam's failures played out in the life of all his natural offspring, so the success of Jesus plays out in all his supernatural offspring offspring. Adam failed, Jesus triumphs. And the obedience, uh, the goal of all this is an obedience to God, not out of trying to win God's favor, but an obedience that's born out of love, uh, where we just love God so much we want to do what God wants. That's uh, the goal uh, that the whole Bible is pressing us to. So, Let's look and see where Scripture makes these points. So uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And so this is connecting Jesus as the last and final Adam. Noah was an Adam who failed. Abraham was an Adam who failed. David was an Adam who failed. Jesus is an Adam who didn't fail. Uh, so there's a connection, a parallel, a contrast between Adam and Jesus. There's a contrast between the dirt man and the God man. Uh, the man from earth versus the man from heaven. Um, and we're going to see how that plays out. Because that first man sinned and God said, on the day you eat it, you will surely die, and you read this story and you realize he lives 930 years, you kind of understand that uh, the Bible's talking about a spiritual death. Uh, Adam died spiritually, and because he's uh, reproducing after his kind, he's 
reproducing dead, little dead spiritual people who are never going to be able to live in God's garden of pleasure. The new covenant is saying God isn't giving up. Uh, He's got this new couple. They are going to love each other fully. They are going to love God fully. And they're going to live in the restored garden of Eden. Paul says this, the first man was from earth. He was a man of dust. He was a dirt man. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. Adam chose uh, his wife over God. He introduced this brokenness into the world and uh, all the different things we see today, the failures, come ultimately from that one man's choice. But look at the contrast. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Um, Jesus said, my people are not of this world. Um, The core of who they are isn't driven by the failures of this dirt man. The core of who they are are driven by the heart of Jesus. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall bear the image of the man from heaven. There's a contrast between Adam, the dirt man, and Jesus, the God man. And there's a contrast between those who are connected to Adam and those who are connected to Jesus. The argument that we're looking at today in Romans uh, 5 is that when Adam died, he died for everybody connected with him. When When he rebelled, the result is death, spiritual death for all those who are connected uh, to uh, to him. And, you know, as kind of 21st century Americans, we might step back from that and say, well, I don't really like that idea that, you know, one guy would play for the side. Uh, Why, if he strikes out, does God count that as me striking out? Uh, How... Uh, whoever agreed to, you know, David fighting Goliath, and if David wins, we all win. I didn't agree to that. Well, I suppose God would say uh, to our modern culture, uh, haven't you ratified the choice that Adam made? Don't you face the exact same choice Adam faces every day, and don't you choose every day to go your own way rather than to go God's way? And I think a moment of reflection, we would all say, well, of course, we do that. Um, The other thing we might point out is that the reason God uh, set it up where one guy would play for the side is because that's exactly the same setup with Jesus. One guy played for the side. And when he hits a home run, we all hit a home run. Uh, Jesus is the new Adam. Uh, John 3 says the same thing. He who comes from above is above all. He is of earth, belongs to the earth, and speaks earth things. I think that's what it literally says uh, in the Greek. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what that means is, when you think about the normal Christian life, if you say, well, you know, if I believe in Jesus, what should I expect in this life? This is what you should expect. In uh, Adam, the moment you were conceived, in Adam, you were born with a defective heart. Your heart was spiritually dead. In fact, the scripture is called a stone heart. The moment you were conceived, that was true. Now, when you were born, uh, it doesn't mean that you were an axe murderer or, you know, this horrible person. When you're born, you were uh, relatively innocent. But the problem is that the core of who you were is this thing that's wrong, this thing that's bent toward evil. Uh, I don't know about 
you if you have brothers and sisters, but did you ever have to teach your little brother how to lie? Did you pull him aside and say, this is how you tell a lie? I know you want to tell the truth, but this is how you lie. Did you ever teach your little brother that? Did you ever teach your uh, little sister how to be selfish? You know, uh, I know you just want to just give everything away, but th this is how you need to be selfish. Did you ever, did you, did you ever learn that, or is that just kind of a natural thing of who you were? Well, the Bible is saying all those actual sins come from this principle, this fallen principle that we have as birth, and that. That fallen principle, if left alone, can putrefy. Salvation is God's grace to the undeserving, where he takes away the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh. And the Bible is making this argument that what your life will look like then is a series of ups and downs. Uh, sometimes when you're walking close to God, sometimes not. But that over time, what's going to happen is that new heart is going to influence who you are. And ultimately, when you see Jesus, what you are in that heart is going to become what you are totally. This is the normal Christian life. This process is called sanctification. The key is, do you have this new heart? And the little note here says, the gift of God's gift of regeneration is so powerful and so certain that it will have its inevitable effect of complete sanctification in the image of Christ. It is a life of progress and pitfalls with measured growth over time. So what you, you know, if you uh, came to Christ today, what should you expect? That's what you should expect. That the core of who you are, you've got a different heart, and you're going to have good days, and you're going to have bad days. Over time, when someone looks at your life, uh, the power of, of evil that wants your fallen heart uh, uh, exercised, that over time, that's going to, uh, gradually dis dis diminish, it's never going to completely disappear in this life. In this life, there are always going to be uh, remnants of that fallen nature. The Bible is saying when, you, when we see Jesus, however, there's a tran complete transformation and that the last remnant uh, of, of that fallen nature is completely gone and we will be like uh, Jesus, like uh, uh, the perfect image of Jesus. Just as we were connected to uh, Adam, uh, so uh, we're now connected uh, to Jesus. Now the corollary of that is that this is the normal pagan life. Uh, when uh, a lifetime pagan is... Uh, conceived, they're conceived exactly like uh, the person who ends up in heaven is conceived. They're uh, conceived and they have this fallen heart. It doesn't mean they're an axe murderer. It doesn't mean that they're a horrible person. When they're born, they're relatively innocent. But if at the core of who they are, you have this broken uh defiled heart, what's going to happen over time is that that heart is going to uh, bring more and more evil to the person. That process is called reprobation. In scripture, uh, it's a statement, the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached full measure. And what you're going to have is... Uh, the seeds of corruption, this is what the note says, inherited from Adam are so powerful and so certain that they will have the inevitable effect of complete reprobation if unchecked by God. Life without grace is a life of pitfall and corruption 
with measured devolution downward into total corruption. If if God just leaves somebody alone, what's always going to happen is that fallen heart is going to begin to influence the person. And maybe for a while you can make yourself a little more moral. Uh, You can double your resolve, but inevitably what's going to happen over time, sin's going to get you. And the more and more you give in to sin, the more powerful it will be until finally, uh, when God closes the door of the spiritual ark, so to speak, what it's going to be is total rep- reprobation, complete transformation into evil. And the Bible is saying those are the two options. Uh, those are the two natural things. So Paul is taking that doctrine and say, if you want to help a racially fractured church, the way you bring that church together is you help them realize the truth of that idea. That everybody's saved by grace and that ultimately everybody's going to end up completely transformed uh, uh, into the image of Christ. And so what what we have in the book of Romans, and you may want to uh, jot a note down here because I think one of the uh, exam questions has to do with the book of Romans. But this this is the um, this is the outline of the book of Romans. So chapters one through eight, Paul's making the argument: Jewish Christian and Gentile Christians are saved by grace alone through Christ's merit alone. And so Paul is saying, um, if you want to bring this church together and you you want there not to be racial uh, divisions, if you want to get rid of that pride, that uh, natural pride that we all have, help people see that everybody's saved the exact same way. Uh, It isn't that you were easier uh, to save uh, by God than somebody else. Um, We were all equally uh, uh, connected to Adam, and so we're all being saved the exact same way. The difficult part of Paul's argument, and we're going to spend a long time on this, is his idea of God's election. And he's going to dive neck deep into it in Romans 9 through 11. And the, the argument there is that individuals uh, who are saved are elected by God. They're predestined to become part of this true Israel. And you start hearing Paul's argument, and you say, "How, Paul, how, how is that fair? You know, you're talking about, you're using these words, predestined, those he predestined. Paul, how is that fair? And that's exactly the argument that he dives into in Romans 9. He's saying, I know. He's saying, I've preached this sermon before. I know how people are going to respond to it. Uh, You will say, who resists his will? And Paul's going to walk us through how he thought through uh, that truth. And then in chapters 12 to 16, Paul is going to say, in light of God's mercy to you, uh, when you realize that God has been merciful to you and that's how you're a believer, how should you live in the world? And how uh, how is that going to make you love other people? The basic argument is how do grace-filled people act in the Christian community with different views on non-essential things? So he's going to say, okay, uh, you non-Jewish uh, Christians, you uh, look at certain things this way. Well, how do you uh, interact with your brother or sister who's committed to food laws that maybe you don't like? Uh, and Paul's going to uh, walk us through um, uh, how to do that. But the center of his argument is this Christocentric uh, argument that we've been seeing all semester that 
that Jesus is the key, understanding that Jesus is ultimately God's people in God's place under God's rule, and that all of us, both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, uh, uh, all, all of us, regardless of our socioeconomic uh, uh, standing, regardless of our, uh, our race, regardless of anything, all of us are only in because of our connection with Jesus. That's his argument. And that's the argument that he thinks will fix the problem at the Roman church. Uh, modern scholar puts it this way, that Israel is reduced to a remnant. And then uh, we have the idea of the 12, but in reality it's just Jesus. It's Jesus' obedience. And the result of that, in Paul's mind, and he outlines this in one five, is this phrase in Greek, into the obedience that comes from faith. Uh, eis uh, apaku eis pistos, into the underhearing of faith, is what that literally says, where you you process reality underneath what God has revealed as his will. That's what he says in one five, And then, I don't know if you've ever picked this up, but when Paul ends Romans, he ends with that exact phrase, into the obedience of faith. Uh, so in Paul's mind, he's arguing for this unity but then he's saying the result of that unity is always going to be a heartfelt obedience to God, where you, you realize what God has done uh, for you, and then you say, you know, if God's done that for me, I want to do it God's way. I want to live the way God wants me to live. If that's really the kind of grace that he's shown me, then I'm going to respond, not because I have to, but because I want to. And so the key there, and I've said it this way, that uh, Eden starts off with two innocent people who fail to love God enough to do what he wants, and their failure exiles them from the Garden of Pleasure. But by the end of the story, what you have is a new couple who freely love God enough to do exactly what he says. And that couple will never be exiled from Eden. Um, in fact, the Eden is going to be turned into the city of God. That's kind of the full stroke, uh, full sweep of the Bible. So people often will say, well, why didn't God create Adam in a way that he couldn't have fallen? You know, why, why even put the tree there? That's uh, kind of the natural question we all have. But I think what God is saying, what Paul is helping us think through is, what if God through the fall is creating a new Eve, the church, and through that making her beyond temptation? What if the way of creating an untemptable Eve is exactly what has happened? God knowing all along that we would never uh, be able to resist temptation. And so God set up a way that he knew would ultimately win our heart and move us beyond the temptation of evil. Ultimately, that it is this. This was always God's plan A, but it was always going to result in a couple who loves God enough to uh, follow his will. And so that's where we're kind of seeing Jesus as the new Adam, the true image of God. Uh, and if that's true, if he's an Adam, then that means he passes on his new heart to all those who would ever come to him by faith. The same way we were connected to Adam uh, as believers, we're connected to Jesus that same way. And you, you think about it, when you were conceived, you weren't 
you weren't an axe murderer, you would, but you did have a fallen heart, and eventually that fallen heart would play out into actual sins. Well, when you're in Jesus, it doesn't mean you're this saint on earth beyond uh, temptation where you're never going to sin. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that that new heart eventually is going to take over who you are. Uh, and eventually, you are going to be in the exact image of Jesus. Spurgeon said it this way, Our Lord Jesus, in some senses, is more completely man than Adam ever was. Um, and I don't know, if you start thinking about that, um, you know, what would have happened if Adam hadn't fallen? I mean, he's living in the garden of pleasure. He can do anything he wants. He has infinite resources. He's going to live forever. What would he do? And then you realize that Jesus is more a perfect Adam, and you realize there's no limit to the um, uh, to the good things that Jesus will do. And when you start thinking about the heavenly city, I mean, you start imagining things like, do you, do you imagine there'll be coffee shops there? Will they be terrible coffee shops or good coffee shops, do you suppose? And there be... Um, do you think there'll be people who play music in heaven? Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen on YouTube uh, uh, the um, Jamaican guitar player Nada. Has anyone ever seen him? So I don't know how he does it, but he can play two different melodies on a guitar with his finger so at the same time. And so he'll take popular songs and with his thumb he'll do the percussion and kind of a bass line melody and then with his top three fingers he'll pick out the melodies of songs. I mean, it's almost preternatural or supernatural and he makes it look effortless. You know, he'll he'll look around and talk to people and, and he'll be playing two different uh, melodies at the same time, well, do you suppose there would be people like that in heaven? Do you suppose if you wanted to take guitar lessons in heaven that you'd have a good teacher there? Or if you wanted to learn about uh, courageous military history, do you think God would let you sit down with Abner or David? Or... Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the uh, hero of Little Round Top. Do you, do you think heavenly Jerusalem would be like that? Do you think you would have close friendships there if you have friendships on earth? Do you think there'll be sports in heaven? If Jesus is in some senses more completely Adam than Adam ever was, then anything that we've developed on earth would have a superior thing in heaven. And that's exactly what the Bible is uh, telling us. So Paul's argument is this. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're believing that Jesus has played for the side, that Jesus has lived the perfect life, that Jesus has loved his neighbor as himself, that Jesus has loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. We haven't done that, but we believe that he has done that and that he's died for our sins, and therefore we have peace with God. God is not angry. Uh, with you uh, anymore if you're in uh, Jesus. Through him, we have obtained access into this grace, into this free gift from God, not because we've earned it or deserved it. Through him, we've obtained access into this grace, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. What does that mean? to rejoice in the hope of God's glory. 
This is what it means. Beloved, we are God's children now. On earth, even with uh, failings and imperfections, we are God's children right now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. Is Jesus temptable by evil right now in heaven? And the answer is no. Jesus hates uh, sin. Jesus is completely untemptable by evil. And the text says when we see him, we'll be like him. I mean, think about the kinds of sins that trip you up over and over. And imagine being able to look at that sin and say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Why, why, why would I ever do that? When we see him, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And then, maybe the most stunning verse in the entire New Testament, Peter says, For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become, and look, look at that, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if that weren't in the Bible and someone said, oh, you can become a partaker of the divine nature, I would say, oh, man, that's a new age thing. That's just not true. Well, the Bible actually says that you may become partaker of the divine nature. Now, that isn't saying you're going to be God. The Bible is clear. There's only one person that's God. But the Bible is saying that there's something about God's nature that God is willing to share with us, a holiness, a untemptableness, uh, by evil, uh, a love for uh, what is good and a, a hatred for what's false. You may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. And you start asking this question that we've started asking a lot, if heaven requires people completely conform to the will and character of God, how can I hope to be in heaven? Well, the way you can hope to be in heaven is this thing that God has promised where uh, you're being transformed into the image of Jesus. You're becoming uh, partakers of God's holiness, his righteousness, his goodness. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness, so says Hebrews 12. Paul's argument, because God's love has been poured into our hearts, the way God is going to make us untemptable by evil is when we start realizing just how much he loves us, just how much he's done things for us. And Paul says that's how you fix a racially fractured church. Get people to understand God's grace. Get people to understand uh, this promise of ultimate transformation. And Paul said that will fix any church. That will bring together people who uh, are uh, from different uh, backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, everything. Jesus, as the new obedient Adam, has earned salvation for everybody by his grace. That's the truth that will fix a racially fractured church. And you might say, well, prove that to me. Prove that, uh, I mean, all the churches I've ever been to, people all look exactly the same. People are from all the churches I've ever been to, people are 
basically from the same socioeconomic group. So show me where this plays out. Okay, I'll show you. Rome, the Romans church, it starts off with a woman named Phoebe. And uh, when we get to that passage, she's called a deacon. Um, it's interesting that she's not called a deaconess. She's actually called a deacon, the same exact word. Uh, uh, deacons likewise, you know, live like this. Uh, so we've got this woman, Phoebe, uh, who's a deacon at the church of Kincrea. And then we have a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who are very wealthy people. In fact, they have a house that's big enough for a whole church to meet in uh, because it says in the church that uh, meets in their house. And then we have a guy named uh, Epinetus who is the first Asian convert. So uh, basically you've got uh, uh, Jewish converts and then you've got this guy who comes from a different uh, nationality, Epinetus. And then there's a woman named Miriam. And of course, Miriam is Moses' sister, so uh, she was a Jew, a converted Jew. And then we have a guy named Am uh, Pilatus, and that name is a common slave name. So here we have wealthy people in the church, and then we have a person who uh, is a slave in that church. And then we have, I love this, Urbanus and Stachus. Urbanus means the city guy. We get the word urban from it, right? Do you see that? Okay, Stachus in Greek means wheat head. Like that's what his name means. So we got city guy and country guy, right? Sitting right next to each other in the church at Rome. And then we have Aristobulus and Herodian. Both of those words uh, refer to like blue blood people, people whose family uh, has had money forever. Uh, the best counsel and the, the hero, uh, what those name means. And then we have a guy named Narcissus and Narcissus is a common name uh, of someone who's worked and bought themselves out of slavery and become a freed, a freed man. So here we have in the church a freed man, an entrepreneur who uh, worked and got out of uh, slavery. And then we have two women, uh, Trophena and Trophosa, <laughs> and their names in Greek mean dainty and luscious. So apparently they were like pagan women who uh, converted to Christianity. So they weren't Jews or they were just converts from pagan Rome. And then we have a guy named Tertius. And Tertius is the guy who actually wrote the book of Romans. Like Paul dictated it and the guy who actually wrote it down was named Tertius. And when I say was named Tertius, he wasn't really named Tertius because Tertius is actually a number. We get the word tertiary from it, and it means three. And so uh, Tertius was a guy who had been in slavery so long that when he was born, they didn't give him a name, they gave him a number. You're one, you're two, you're three. Tertius' name was three. And the whole reason that you and I can uh, read the book of Romans is because Tertius was smart. He learned how to read and write. He uh, then made his living by writing things down. And when he uh, writes his name, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you. He didn't even have a name. He just had a number. 
And right next to him was a man named Erastus. And Erastus was the director of public uh, works at Corinth. And if you go to Corinth today, they'll take you to a piece of pavement. You know how when you're in a city and it'll say something like Sparta founded in you know 1845 by John uh, uh, Freeman or something like that. You know how you'll have stamps like that? Well, you go to Corinth and you have pavement that says, I, Erastus, paid for the paving of this road. So in the church in Corinth was a guy who was born into the kind of poverty where he didn't even have a name and he was welcomed in that church and a guy who was so rich that he paved the roads in Corinth and those guys sat next to each other on the same pew in the same church. Because Paul knew, Paul knew ultimately that uh, Christianity was going to destroy slavery. He knew that. But he knew that in the world he lived, two-thirds of uh, everybody who was alive was enslaved. And he knew that the power of Christianity could bring all people together. Races, socioeconomic, all of it. And we see it in the church uh, in the, this list of names. Jew, Gentile, uh, city person, country person, uh, blue blood, uh, someone from no background, and they're all worshiping Jesus together, and they're all growing uh, on this road to complete uh, transformation. Paul knew uh, that his argument was powerful. Jesus is able to bring all of us together. Um, the understanding the grace of Jesus can conquer the the minor things that make us uh, different. Well, that's what I have for you today. I hope you have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you on Monday.